Hey, it's Chessie from Squeegee and Ink, and in this class, we're going to be printing this multicolor poster design using a very simple hinge clamp setup. Squeegee and Ink started as an open access screen printing studio, specializing in flatbed printing and bespoke custom artwork poster printing. Normally, we'd use like heavy machinery to get these prints done. However, I've broken it down into a more simple setup that you might even be able to have at home. This artwork is actually quite a complicated design. It's taken from our NFT collection. It's made up of nine colors and nine layers. However, I'm gonna break it down for you in a series of step-by-step -step tutorials to show you how you would recreate something like this or your own artwork. Additionally, when taking this course, you'll have full access to our poster printing template. In this course, we will cover multicolor artwork preparation, mesh count and exposure placement, hinge clamp setup, including inks and equipment, screen registration, printing technique, and artwork finishing. Everything in this video can be set up in a small home studio. When it comes to screen printing multicolor images, it's a little bit different from screen printing single color. We have to think of things like registering the layers so they sit nicely next to each other. It's also useful to use vector artwork and it's also a consideration where we might be adding strokes and traps so that the artwork sit slightly on top of each other and all these kind of considerations are going to be demonstrated in the template that I've made for you and we're going to run through that now. The template is an Illustrator file even though it's saved as .pdf so I'm going to open up Illustrator and find it in my downloads so it's very important to use to open it up from within Illustrator and not just onto your desktop or in Photoshop because it might appear blank and we want to be able to edit it fully. So I can go File, Open, and I'll find it in my Downloads folder. So it's this poster printing template, and I can press Open. And as you can see, there's two quite big artboards, and these are actually to scale to the size of the screen and roughly what the hinge clamps might even look like that are going to be holding our screens. And um, on the left hand side, there's the fully separated artwork as an example and on the right hand side this is where you're going to separate your artwork and determine all the different colors and plot out all your separations in this example we have vectors which are cookie cut out of each other so as you can see there there's not just a big um, square if i pull it over it looks like all the other layers are all cut out already so if i show you um, a raster image of that which is which contains pixels if I zoom in you can see the pixels but also this is just one solid shape so this might be something you can manipulate in Photoshop but for Illustrator we need nice clean vectors so if I go over to the left hand side and show you what kind of choices we made we are using the 23 by 31 inch screen so that is to size I've determined the safe zone of that screen, so that's where emulsion is going to be on the screen and it's also not going to be too tight to print um, in, within this area, so any artwork that falls in there is going to be printable. This grey box here, this is our paper, so we've determined that we want to print this at, on a piece of paper that is 35 centimetres or 350 millimetres and that's a square. And we've also determined that that piece of paper is big enough to hold our registration marks, which are here. And it's also leaving us room in this kind of section for a border around our artwork for framing. So you're going to determine what your paper size is, but it's, it's really useful to have it on this template so that you can adapt that paper size and make sure it fits within the, the safe zone make sure your registration marks are going to be printed onto it and that's going to allow you to print your artwork really accurately and line up your layers. So on here as well we've got our colours that are in our image and 
Then we've isolated each colour, turned it black, and they're going to be ready to make into film positives. Let me show you how I'd separate this artwork again. So I am going to take the paper and I'm going to press Command C and then Command V, which is copy and paste. Or I can say, I can select it and say object, no, edit, copy, and then edit, paste. So I've got my piece of paper and I want it to be under those reg marks. So I can say object, arrange, and then send backwards or send to the back. Or you can press command and this bracket. So I might actually do the bracket. So I'm going to go command, bracket, 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 underneath all of the reg marks until it appears with the reg marks on top of it. So you can center that within this kind of space and you could even lock it now so that you don't accidentally move that paper. You could do that by pressing command two or going, if I undo it, then I can show you. You could select it and say object lock selection, which is also showing you that that's command two is the shortcut. That's locked now. And now I'm ready to take copy this piece of artwork so I'm going to select it. I can press command C, command V and pull it over again. I'm just going to zoom in so that I try and get it a little bit more accurate within my page. That's pretty cool. So my piece of artwork is ready now to determine what colours are in it so I can figure out how many layers I'm actually going to print this artwork in. I think I'm going to do spot colours for all of them. Even with the background, I'm thinking of doing a lavender square, uh, lavender square and then I'm going to do a gradient going from orange into light to show the lavender square underneath it. So I'm not going to be doing a split fountain, which is where you put different ink colours on the screen, pull it and then they blend. I'm going to do it um, in separate layers. So I'm going to show you how to do all that. So let's go and pick all of the colours that are in the artwork. I tend to go for light colours first and then um, after at the end I want to be printing like my black outlines and my gradients and background colours. So if I think about what colour I want to print first, I think I'm going to go for this lighter pink. This white is actually the paper colour, so I don't need to think about that one. So I'm going to pick a swatch. Let me show you the swatches. This swatch here, it currently has a black outline and zero fill. If I go to the eyedropper tool, I can zoom in a little bit. So you can press Z and click and hold, or you can go to this little zoom icon go back to my eyedropper tool and I can pick out that pink and that will fill my swatch with the colour that I've selected in the image. So let me see what other colour I went for next. I went for grey. So this one here is going to be grey in the image. So I have that in his cheek. So I can go ahead and eyedropper tool that cheek area. And then this one. And I can go ahead and select all the colours in that image. For, for the purple colour, if I was to eyedrop at all this background section, I might get a blend in that box. However, I know what the, um, the code of that lavender colour that I want. So what I can do is I can switch, select the swatch, and I can switch the fill and colour with this little icon here. I can double click on the fill colour and then I can manually enter the colour code here. The colour code for this is b 6 a 2CF. So that should be a nice lavender colour. And then it's same for the orange. I have to determine that manually. So I can switch the fill on this toggle. Double click the fill and it brings me up the colour picker. And then I'm going to manually enter the orange, which is E 
C24. And that's my nice bright orange color that I'm going to have later. And then this one is going to be black. So I can just eyedropper in his eye. And there you go. I've determined all the colors that are going to be in this image. And it comes out as a nine color or layer artwork that I'm going to be printing. I've got nine different colors and therefore nine different layers in my artwork. I need to make nine different copies of my artwork, including these registration marks. If your image only has four colors, that's going to mean that you're going to do this a lot quicker than I am, and you're only going to need to make four layers and four copies of the original image to then separate. I'm ready to select this, which is my artwork layer, and I'm going to copy and paste down into this section, and then I'm going to make eight more copies. When I have my nine copies, I'm ready to label and distinguish which layer is going to be which color. I, I am actually going to just use the, the selections that I've made up here. So the first one I'm going to figure out is which one is this dusty pink color. So I can select it and copy and paste it and I can drag it down to my first layer. I'm going to zoom in and make a swatch here. I can make it nice and neat, maybe the length of the whole thing. And then I can write what layer it is and what color. This is going to help us print a little bit quicker when it comes around to it and make sure that we don't print the wrong color on the wrong layer. I need to bring that down a little bit so it doesn't go into the image area. So this is where I don't want any ink to be. So I'm going to put it down. I'm going to write on top of it. So I'm going to use the type tool and plot it here. I like to use Arial just because it looks good. I'm going to use caps and I'm going to say layer one, dusty pink. I might even make this font white. You can select that and pull it into white. Just trying to make everything look a bit neat. So I'm gonna go ahead and label each layer with the color that I want it to be. I've determined what each layer is called and e also which color I'm going to be printing on each one. So now I'm ready to go ahead and isolate and delete the unnecessary colors and layers from each of my nine copies. So for example, in this, this one, I'm going to do this quite manually to show you fully, but this one I'm going to try and lock all of the dusty pink in the image. Then I'm going to select and delete anything that isn't dusty pink and then I'm going to turn it black eventually. So I can zoom in and what I've done beforehand is I've kind of cleaned it up and I've made sure that every time I've got this pink it's exactly the same color code wherever you find it. So I'm going to go ahead and select using the direct selection tool which is A on the keyboard and then I'm going to hold down shift so that I can select multiple ones. So I'm going to select this one this one and inside the nose. And then I'm gonna go object, lock selection or command two. So I'm actually just gonna press command two and now they're locked so they can't be moved. But all these other layers, I'm just gonna need to delete. So 
So what I could do is I can drag a square around, trying to avoid the registration marks, which is really important. And then I'm just going to have them all selected and delete them. So now I'm only left with my dusty pink colours. I can then go Object, Unlock All. And now I've only selected these three. So I could, at this point, make the fill pure black, which is all these zeros, and press OK. And then I could go ahead and do that for the other colours. So on layer two, the only little bits of grey are on this cheek and next to the nose. So I can go ahead and press A, which is the direct selection tool again, click, hold down my shift key, let me zoom in a little bit, and then select the other little bit of nose that's grey. Then I'm going to press command two to lock it, and then I'm going to delete everything else. Really nice and quick. Then I can say object unlock all, or that's the shortcut there. And then I can make that pure black. And that one is also ready to go. I'm going to work my way through the other room just now quite quickly. For the lavender layer, you might see that it's actually part of this blend, so what I want to do here is, it's already cookie cutted out, so this is the exact shape that I want it to be, but there's also this kind of blend layer over the top, so I want to delete this blend layer, which is the orange, and I'm left with my lavender behind. So it's just hidden, so I can still lock it, delete everything that was on top of it, and I'm just left with the background layer and the rabbit isn't going to be printed on top of the lavender it is cut out so that I've got this paper colour shining through for his hair and his mouth and his chest. If I unlock that and I'm going to have this as a pure colour so I'm going to still make it all black so I'm going to print it as one big open area of mesh. The orange however this is slightly different I want this to be a nice gradient halftone coming down over the top of the lavender. So if I um, still take that layer and I lock it, I can go ahead and delete all of everything else that isn't that orange blend. So I'm left with this colour blend that I'm ultimately trying to get. I can unlock it and then all I want to do is when I've got this selected, Hopefully you can see the gradient tab, or you can go window and down to gradient and make sure it's ticked so you can see what this is. This is if you want to have a colour blend in, in yours. And then I'm just going to change the top of the gradient to pure black and then have the bottom colour where it's fading into. I want that to be white so that it's going to overlay on top of that lavender and make this nice sunset effect. So I can select this orange section go to the colour dropper and I'm going to actually auto, uh, manually pick that I want this pure black and then I will change this lavender colour to a white so no ink is laid down at the bottom pull it all the way up so you get all the F's and then if you wanted to you could pull this bar left and right so that the gradient changes I'll try and so it's a, I'm just going to try and copy this so I don't mess it up but I'm just going to show you, you can have it so that the gradient is quite saturated at the top and then it goes to not very much ink being laid down or you can have it so that the gradient is really full up here and just tapers off at the end. So I'm going to paste in what it was originally. This gradient is ready for my RIP software to um, apply a half tone to it and I'm going to be using a 90T mesh screen which means that I want to use a half tone which is 51 LPI when I'm outputting that little bit of the film um, and it's going to automatically add my dots in there and make a nice smooth gradient. The last layer is black which is again the same process as before. I might just delete out a little bit of this quickly so I can see a little bit better. I can select all my black. And 
lot of things I go so I don't miss any. I don't want to miss any bits so I'm just going to be a little bit more manual about it. And also check that this black is pure black. It's a little bit of white that I've missed in his eyes, which I'm going to take out. Double check his fill is all black. And he's ready to go as well. Technically, now I have my artwork separated into all the colours, I should be able to go ahead and start getting those exposed on screens and printing. But there's a few things that I've missed, um, which is there's no margin of error built in. So I would have to print all of these layers like absolutely perfectly with no misalignment at all. And I'd have to be printing the artwork right next to each other. There's no overlap or anything built in there to help us out when we're lining these up. Because we're only just doing it on hinge clamps and we're not using a vacuum table, it might be quite tricky to make a full edition of prints with nine layers with no um, errors at all. So I'm going to show you uh, a couple of little tricks to build into your artwork to make it a little bit more foolproof and easier. The, the easiest one to start off showing you is probably this black layer because the black is going to go down last and it might even cover up some tiny little misalignments of all the other colours when they're sitting next to each other. So. At the moment, if I go over here, I can see that originally I've put a 0.5 PT stroke around this black. So I've essentially made it fatter so that it, it overlays into the other colours slightly and it blocks them out. It's also important that this is the black there, so it's, it's actually going to be able to overlay and cover the other lighter colours underneath it. So if I um, go ahead and put a stroke on my new one, I can select it and then I can go up to the stroke tab and I can just increase the stroke weight up to 0.5. I need to double check that if I double click this stroke colour that it's all the way down into the zero so it's pure black again. And another little thing I need to think about is where the stroke is because um, automatically it might have the stroke aligned to the center of these parts. But I want it to sit on the outside. So I'm going to say align stroke to the outside and it's kind of flipped it and made it quite chunky. The problem with this is that if I look at my original artwork and I look at the bottom of the design, if I make this black layer, I'll, make it, I'll just do it here for you, I put a 0.5 stroke on it, it actually is going to sit further and it's going to distend further than the purple, I mean the lavender, the blue and all these other ones and it's going to look odd. So what I want to do is still add the stroke so that I've got that leeway but I want to make a white box to kind of cover over this little anom anomaly here um, and that should still allow me to do my stroke but then just cover up any little, little errors in there. So what I can do is draw a little box if I take my stroke off quickly, take it off, and then I'm going to draw a white box which is exactly lined up to the bottom of this and it's going to cover any any overlay. So make it white. And I'm going to zoom right in and I'm going to move my white box. Really, really zoom in and make it so it's just butting up against that. I can zoom out again. I can lock this box. I can add my stroke on and it's going to hopefully be underneath that box and I can go ahead and put my nice chunky 0.5 point on it and I'll have no problem at all. Make sure that the box, the white box is the top layer so it's over the top of the black and we should be good to go on that layer. Now I'm going to figure out if I need this stroke on any other colours. Um, if I go up to my artwork again, 
which one did I do it on before? I did it on the dark mauve and I did it on the light teal. And okay, so I've gone into the dark mode. So I'm saying this color, this is just determined when you've got a little bit of experience in printing, but if I do it on this, this one here, then I'm not gonna get a white line possibly in between the light and the dark mode. So I'll add it on that one. And I'm gonna add it on this color here so that it underlays a little bit under the dark teal and into the black. So that shouldn't be any harm at all. I might just copy this white box, Command C, Command V. So I've got a new box. I'm going to put it in place. I might actually just colour this yellow or something so that I can see where it is and I can zoom in and put it really, really, really close up to here. I can turn it white again. I can make sure it's the top layer by going object, arrange, bring to the front. I can lock it and then I can select all the light blue and add the stroke onto it. So I'm gonna make it 0.5. Double check that the stroke is pure black again. And then I can go ahead and do that on the mauve as well. The mauve doesn't actually need one of those white blocks because it's not protruding outside that neat little square that I'm trying to protect. So I can really easily just select this one, add its 0.5 stroke on, make sure it's black, and I am good to go. My separations are all ready to print onto film positives now. I'm gonna print them on acetate sheet using my Epson printer. Um, and I'm also gonna be using my RIP software in between there to make sure they're really rich and dark for my exposures. This is something that you might have set up in your own studio or there are professional studios available where they can output your film and even expose your screens for you. When it comes to choosing which mesh to have on your screen when you're printing onto paper, like we are in this example, we want to stick within the mesh range of 62T up to 90T mesh. That way we're not laying down too much ink onto the, onto the paper, which might not be able to hold as much ink as say a t-shirt. So for eight of our layers, we're actually going to use the 62T mesh. So for all of the, the bolder layers like this black and the lavender background. However, when it comes to this, very fine artwork here on layer eight is this kind of gradient effect. This has very fine details which a 62T mesh wouldn't be able to hold. So we're actually going to use a 90T mesh on this particular layer so that it can hold the fine dots and deposit a nice thin layer of ink right at the end of our addition. When it comes to exposing your screens, you might find that you can actually put multiple layers on the same screen. That's because you can move the paper stock underneath the screen and you're not constrained where you need to locate those images. So just make sure they're in the center, in, within the safe zone of your screen, not too close to the edges, and you might find that you can pack on two or even three layers per screen to save on costs. Normally in the studio when it comes to printing posters we'd use our vacuum flatbed press. However, I want to show you a really quick and simple method just using hinge clamps which you can do at home. Hinge clamps are basically just a pair of these. So they'd clamp around your screen in this section here and then they would just be screwed into a tabletop or maybe a thick piece of MDF like we're going to use today and they just hold it in place and it just means that you can tilt your screen up and down and it means that you can consistently print in the same location 
when, when you're doing your whole edition and it just makes everything a little bit easier when it comes to registering multiple colour prints. Let me show you all the things that my setup consists of. So the first thing is my pre-exposed screen. So that's my 23 by 31 inch screen and most of my screens for this project are gonna be 62 T mesh. And that's already got my image pre-burned onto it in the middle. Then I went and got a really nice big chunky bit of MDF so that I could protect my table because I'm gonna screw in my hinge clamps and I didn't want to damage the table. So I'm going to screw one in there and one in there. I've already got my paper stock, which is a nice thick one. So it can take quite a heavy deposit of ink because we're, go we're going to print nine layers on this. So I've got that pre-cut into my 35, 35 centimeter, but obviously you'd have whatever your design looks best on. Then I have, this is um, just some pre-mixed inks. So I've got Sailor Rowney water-based ink. That one I've gone for because it's really easy to get in the UK. And I've just got it in all the different colors. So I've got nine. And then I've got my little drying rack. You don't specifically need a drying rack. It just makes it easier. Just make sure you've got a place to put all your wet prints in between layers. Um, then I have my screen tape. So this is a bit better than just packing tape because it doesn't leave residue on my screen when I'm masking off areas where I don't want the ink to go through. Then I've got my silicone spatula. This is just from the kitchen department on online and it's really, really good, easy to use. And my squeegee, which is bigger than, is wider than my image and registration marks so that I can print all four registration marks in one go. I also have, because this is water-based ink, I've got a bucket with some water in it, a little sponge and a rag for cleaning up the ink in between layers. That's pretty much the whole setup. So yeah, I can start masking off my screen and screwing in my hinge clamps. We're about to register our first screen, so I've broken down the process into six easy to follow steps that are repeatable. Step one is to take our first layer, our first screen, which is the lightest color, and pop the hinge clamps on there and tighten them. Step two is to add a snap. So I'm going to use two two penny coins. So a snap is basically a distance from the surface of the paper and the bottom of the screen. So what you want is for the screen to touch the paper and then jump back off. So I would say it's a, it's a two P's height all the way across. So what's happening at the moment with the hinge clamps is they're actually a little bit higher and then it goes down. So the distance is higher here and it goes down to almost nothing at the end. So I'm going to attach two coins to the underside of the screen in the corner and that will artificially give us a more even distance all the way around the screen. So I'm just going to put those on with masking tape. And then you can literally just push the screen up against the wood and you can try and assess whether that's even all the way across. Yeah. 
Step three is to take your paper, place it underneath your screen, and then you can look through your screen and try and locate the paper so that it's straight underneath. Step four is to, is to apply some tape around the edges of the paper so that you can butt the paper up against the edges and keep your registration throughout the whole edition. I'm just going to be using some thick structured tape and I'm going to apply that in long strips to two sides. Step five is to start printing your first layer. So I still have open areas of mesh where I definitely don't want any ink to go through. So I'm actually gonna mask off some of this writing and maybe the edges, but I'm gonna keep the registration marks open because I want to print those. So I'm just gonna use some screen tape. And mask off the areas of open mesh. I don't think I'm going to get ink anywhere near those far edges. Um, I'm going to keep it quite contained to this middle bit, so that's probably it for that. Yeah, my squeegee ready. And the first colour is the dusty pink. This is the System 3 by De La Rowney ink. And we've added a little bit of screen printing medium just to stop it drying in the mesh too quickly and to give it a nice flow when we're printing. So I'm going to add a really generous amount, pretty much the whole tub, the whole length of the image. I'm trying to build up a wall of ink so that my squeegee can glide over the surface of that um, of the screen. Step six is to clean up the ink and remove the tape and just take that screen off. So I'm going to pop it back into the tub as much as I can.
I can remove this tape. I like to put it in some newsprint and wrap it up. And then um, I'm just gonna get a sponge and some water and take all that ink off the mesh. I'm also going to take my spatula and squeegee and wash those up in the sink. So I'm finished with that layer. This is the first layer completed. So at this stage, I'm going to stack, let them all dry first of all, then stack them up ready for my second layer. It's very similar in the processes of how we lay down the second and third layers, but there's just a couple of little tweaks that I need to talk to you about when it comes to registering one layer up to these current registration marks. Back to step one, we're going to select the screen which corresponds to our next lightest colour. So I have that here. I can attach it in the hinge clamps. Like that. And then I'm ready for step two. Step two is to apply the coins to the underside of the screen to create that snap that we need. Step three is slightly different for the subsequent layers because this time we have some registration marks printed from the first prints that we did. So in this case, we're gonna put the paper underneath the screen. And now we're going to line up the exposed registration marks with the printed registration marks underneath. So take your time with this and this is very important so we wanna be really accurate. Step four is the same. So we're putting our thick tape right really, really close to the edge all the way along on both sides. Step five is printing. So I'm going to mask off the open areas of mesh around my screen where I don't want the ink to go again. And I can put my ink on and print the second layer. I have my first sheet underneath because that's the one I registered up against. So I'm going to start with my first layer and then I'm going to build up the whole addition.
Step six is cleaning the ink up and taking all the tape off. This is what the second layer looks like and as you can see by the registration marks the grey has gone over the dusty pink and is lined up so it is in register. Make sure to use the same registration technique throughout your entire edition. Now let's move on to some print technique tips. Let's talk about printing techniques. The first thing is probably the squeegee angle. So when we're actually printing with the squeegee, we want to print with this, this edge of the blade. So we actually hold the squeegee down and we're having it about 45 degrees. And you want to keep that angle consistent the entire way through the print and try not to change the angle as you come up to the edge of the screen so that you, you might actually like compensate for hitting the edge and you might twist the angle higher. So we want to keep it all the same, even if you do end up smacking into the side of the frame. That's better than changing your angle at the last minute. The pressure at which you print is also very important. So that's the pressure that you're putting the blade under. So if you're doing it too lightly, you might find that you're not clearing the mesh of the ink. And if you're doing it very hard, you're probably not actually going to get bad results, but your angle also has to be perfect so you avoid bleeding and smudging of the ink. If your squeegee angle is at 45 degrees, you can push quite hard and maintain clearing the mesh easily. If your squeegee angle is a bit lower, your blade is going to buckle under the pressure of the, of the force that you're, you're printing and it's basically going to smudge the ink onto your paper. So what I try and tell people is to push down until you can feel the board underneath and maintain that pressure all the way through the print and follow through after your print as well. The speed at which you print is another factor to consider. So I find that a lot of people go very, very quickly. Um, this might just mean that you're not putting enough um, emphasis on starting and finishing the print. The other things to consider when you're thinking about print speed are probably the viscosity of the ink. So very thick inks like whites or metallics, they just let them have a little bit longer on the screen so they can flow. You can definitely put the amount of pressure on. And then as it comes to thinner inks, you might find that printing faster means that you can, it, the ink isn't flowing through onto the paper too quickly. Flooding your screen in between prints is very important, especially with water-based ink, as you can find that the ink dries into the mesh and might block your design. So every time we print, we then leave it with a nice thin flood stroke over it, so it's all covered in ink, ready for our next print. Let's put all that information together and I'll talk you through how I do a print. So the first thing, I'm using quite a lot of ink, I like to work with a lot of ink because most of it goes back in the tub anyway and it's better to have more than less with this. That stops you flooding it too much and you know missing parts of your printing. The next thing I'm thinking about is my squeegees a little bit bigger than my image on either side. That just means I'm not going to miss any. When I do my first print I like to get my whole squeegee blade covered in ink. 
That means that the squeegee is going to glide across the mesh and not bumble across because that can leave lines in your print when it comes on the print on the paper. And also just build a, a line, like a kind of wall of ink before your squeegee so that you're actually dragging all that ink and it's rolling in front of your squeegee. I'm lifting the screen up a little bit so that I'm not printing prematurely. And this is my flood stroke. So I'm holding the squeegee in the middle. If I've got something to rest it on, I can hold it with two hands or I can hold it in the middle with one hand. So it's a light drag of the ink. I'm not forcing it, it's just pretty much the weight of the squeegee. All the way across. And I can see that I've gone a little bit further than the image area and it's all filled up with ink. This time, I kind of do pull a little bit of the ink back up onto the squeegee at the top so I've got something to glide the squeegee against and now I'm ready for my print stroke. So I get my body weight over the image, I'm not walking back as I'm printing, my chest is over it, I can push down until I fill the board, I'm starting a few centimetres before the image area and I'm trying to keep the same angle all the way throughout. So I'm pushing down on the board and I'm still pushing quite slowly I'm keeping all that force all the way through the image. I've, I've printed all the image area and I've got a couple of centimeters more. And then I can lift up, do my flood for my next one. So you can flood in either direction, but it's important to always print in the same direction. If you print forwards and backwards, you're actually gonna hit the ink onto the paper at different angles, and then you might find some misregistration. But you can, um, flood the screen from each direction. So I'm going to flood from this side. And that just means that the ink is staying um, and it's not drying in that mesh when I'm moving my paper around. And then I can check my print to make sure it's nice and sharp. If, if you have any areas missing, that would mean that you haven't flooded it nicely. You haven't filled the ink up with the mesh beforehand. If there's smudges, you might have flooded it once or twice or even three times and that might force the ink through to the underside of the print and then it's kind of smudged underneath. I wouldn't worry about it. I'd get some fresh bits of um, paper under there, clear the mesh, maybe clean it up and just start again. But that's, that's all the different print technique things that I can tell you about all in one go. When we're printing flat stock normally, we might actually be using our vacuum board. So that is a big printing press and it holds the paper down with a, with a vacuum. But in this case, we've only got this board and the hinge clamps. So it might become necessary to actually hold the paper down a little bit as you're printing, especially when it comes to your last layers, to keep them in place and so they don't peel off the bottom of the screen. So, a couple of things that you could do there is you could be using a spray tack. This is normally used for holding down t-shirts, but a very light misting could help you hold the paper in place. You can also get a very small amount of water-based adhesive and put that on, take the majority of the tack off and that will again hold the paper down. The problem is when you're putting your next sheet of paper down, say you've done your first print, you go to get your second sheet, when you're coming to register it, you might be fighting against the tack. So you kind of want to avoid it as much as possible, but you can go to it if you need it during the end of your print run. Um, some other little things to consider, if it is peeling off the bottom of your screen, it might mean that you haven't got enough distance from the bottom of your screen and the board. So you could increase your snap slightly. That might also help. And printing higher up on the image following all the way through and hopefully that will also help the screen bounce back off your paper and stop that peeling.
We've just finished the addition and it was a really fun little project to do. Uh, we're really happy with the result and we're now ready to put the finishing touches together and get this ready for sale. As you can see, the print still has its registration marks on there. So there's a few different ways of cutting that down nicely. The first being using the guillotine. Secondly, you could use a scalpel and the edge of a ruler, or you can even do a deckled edge, which is like a torn paper effect along the border. I personally really think um, a combination of deckled and guillotine straight cut edges looks really good. So to begin with, I'm going to go through the whole edition and I'm going to do two sides um, on the guillotine. Then I'm going to follow that up by hand tearing the deckled edges. As you can see, I've used the inside of the registration marks to cut up against. And then I've, um, after my first cut, I then use this line up against the edge of the guillotine to be able to create the second straight edge. I'm only gonna cut these two sides and then I'm gonna put them to one side and then I'm gonna decal the other two edges. I've completed my two straight cuts, so now I'm ready to do my deckled edges. I'm just going to push this out of the way and show you how I do a deckled edge. I'm going to use the registration marks as before, and all I need for it is actually just a, a metal ruler. I'm going to hold it against two of the registration marks, and then I'm just going to hand tear it. I find that if you hold it quite close to the edge of the metal and just do lots of little, little pulls, little tears, it's not too dramatic and it just gives a really nice finish. So that's the kind of effect that I'm going for with my border and it still leaves room at the bottom for doing an addition size. One of the great things about doing a screen print edition is that the scarcity of that edition becomes limited so that a smaller edition size might mean that your print is more valuable. One way to show what edition this is and which one in the edition it is, is to write it in the bottom. So I'm going to have the edition number here, I'm going to title the artwork, then I'm going to sign and date it. The last step I'm going to take with my prints is actually to weigh them down underneath some glass because there's a heavy saturation of ink and I want them to be like perfectly flat when I send them to people. So I'm literally just gonna put the addition on top of each other, place my glass over the whole surface, and then I'm gonna 
put lots of heavy books on there and weigh it down nice and flat so it's really presented professionally. Thank you so much for following this class. I hope you found it really useful and fun. Um, we would love to see what you come up with when you follow our process and hopefully you can come up with a really cool addition. We'd love to know how many colours you ended up doing, uh, what the addition size was, so please leave any reviews. And if you're struggling with anything, contact us directly and we'll, I'm sure we'll be able to guide you in the right direction.